Okay, so it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the evening, Jen Diaz, with the topic of understanding the web content accessibility guidelines. Jen is a full stack developer at Sparkbox. In this role, she enjoys helping clients improve their web accessibility and is passionate about supporting Sparkbox's goal of creating a better web. She completed the Flatiron Coding Bootcamp in 2020 and has been an active volunteer and most recently a director of Women Who Code Boulder Denver Chapter. When she isn't advocating for accessibility and women in tech, Jen enjoys cycling, spending time with her two dogs and her newest hobby, snowboarding. Jen, I yeah. will pass it to you. Awesome. Thank you, Jen. All right. Okay, everything is up there. So um, thank you all for uh, coming this evening. I am uh, I really like talking about accessibility. So anytime I get a chance to, I appreciate that people are also excited to attend. Um, I wanted to start with why I chose this topic specifically. Um, so a few months ago, I started studying for my IAAP CPAC exam. Um, and the questions around the accessibility guidelines and, and WCAG were ones that I sort of struggled with. So um, I wanted to put a talk together in part to help me study, but also to hopefully help other people with some of the concepts that I struggled with. Um, then I, I did just want to mention that the talk is understandable for people of all level levels, but it is not an intro to accessibility talk. So if you're interested in those, I did pop two in the meetup um, from previous years that people have done. So I encourage you to look at those if it's a new topic for you. Um, and then uh, you'll notice going through the slides that there's a little bit of a Valentine's Day theme. Uh, this was originally supposed to be in February um, and that uh, new hobby of mine snowboarding actually resulted in me getting a concussion. So we had to reschedule. I'm feeling much better now and I'm um, excited to give you all the talk uh, this month in March. So to start with just a little bit more about me, Again, my name is Jen Diaz. I'm a developer at Sparkbox, and I'm one of the newest uh, directors for Women Who Code Boulder, Denver. I recently took my IAAP um, core competency certification exam, and I'm excited to announce that as of um, last week, I am officially certified. Uh, it's something that I've been studying for a while, so it definitely made a nice end to my week to get that email. Uh, if you'd like to find me on LinkedIn, uh, it's just under my full name, so Jennifer Grenier Diaz, and then Slack, you can find me it's just under Jen Diaz. Um, and then I just want to touch on certifications a little bit. So certifications are expensive, and um, that's definitely a barrier for a lot of people to um, consider studying for them. But I did want to point out that IAAP does have certification opportunities, uh, excuse me, scholarship opportunities for their certifications. Uh, and I also found the prep information for this certification to be very valuable. So even if you don't want to sit for the certification, I, I think the resources around it are really helpful for anyone wanting to learn more about it. All right, now quick overview of what I'm going to be talking about this evening. So we're going to start with an introduction to web content accessibility guidelines, talk a little about, about their history, where they are today how they're organized. And then I'm going to dive into each of the principles a little bit more with some examples for each one. And then we have um, just a summary at the end and some opportunities for questions. Um, I do have uh, three links that I gave to Jen that she can pop in the chat for me. Um, I've got a uh, code pen and then the slides and um, a link to the guidelines. Um, the slides and the code pen are separate, so don't worry about, you know, your name popping up or anything over here. Well, that won't happen. Uh, and then while I was putting these slides together, I was using a template that had these like kind of cool looking jellyfish pictures, but did not feel very relevant to accessibility at all. Uh, so I wanted to find something else that I could put on those slides, but um, was kind of out of ideas at first. And then I was reading this article from um, the Sparkbox Foundry called Getting Comfortable with WCAG. And I pulled out a quote from the author, Ethan Mullen. He said that these four principles might feel unnecessary, but they serve as an important reminder that we're building for people. So throughout my slides, I um, have included pictures of four different disability advocates, um, just as a way to introduce you to what other people are doing in this field. And then just you know to tie it back to where uh, we're building things accessibly to benefit um, our users. 
All right, so starting by diving into what is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. So these guidelines are created by W3C, which is the World Wide Web Consortium. And this is an organization that develops web standards and accessibility is just one part of what they do. First version was released in 1999. Um, and this was a very significant early step um, in accessibility. Then in 2008, we got version 2.0. And 10 years later, 2018, we got 2.1. Um, and this is where we are today, but as early as April, um, version 2.2 is scheduled to be published. Um, and while all that is happening, version 3.0 is already in its draft phase. Um, so why is this an important thing for us to understand? So around the world and in the United States, um, legal requirements for accessibility are increasingly referencing WCAG as the standard to meet. So uh, while you're writing code, while you're creating content, and by meeting WCAG, that's a kind of first step to ensure that you're meeting legal requirements for accessibility. And then I do also just want to note that meeting WCAG is just part of creating accessible content. So a site could meet all of these guidelines and still have barriers for users with disabilities. So user testing, specifically with people with disabilities, manual and automated testing, and incorporating accessibility in the planning process should all be a part of an organization's accessibility efforts. Um, I did mention that 2.2 is coming out shortly. I really encourage you to take a look at those to see um, what's going to be added and how things are going to be changing in the coming months. But this presentation is going to be focusing on 2.1. All right, so how are the guidelines organized? So on this slide, I have a pyramid that I've adapted from 100 days of A11Y, uh, which is a great resource if you do decide to study for either the certifications, I, I would recommend peeking at it. Um, starting at the bottom of the pyramid, we have four principles, and those are perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And then we have 13 guidelines. Under those 13 guidelines, we have a various success criteria. And then for each of the success, success criteria, uh, we have um, techniques in order to meet them. The success criteria are breaking down into three conformance levels, A, AA, and AAA with AA being the, um, the level that most people are aiming for. And usually if a law or standard um, references a specific level, it's going to be AA. So let's start by taking a look um, at the actual guidelines. So I, um, I think it kind of looks like my statistics textbook from college. So I, I recognize that it can be a little bit of an intimidating document, but I hope by explaining a little bit more about how it's organized, you'll get more comfortable with it and be more likely to reference it while you're working. So looking at just this one here for an example, we've got success criteria on 1.2.3. Um, so these numbers um, mean something, which is not something I was aware of when I first started studying. So the first one letter, that one, that is telling you the principle that it falls under. So in this case, one, it's perceivable. And then two, this is referencing the guideline. So if we go over here, we've got perceivable, that's one, and then one, two, so we're under time-based media. And then three is the success criteria, audio description and media alternatives. And then in this little square over here, you've got two links, understanding and how to meet. Um, understanding gives you uh, kind of more of the background information and uh, notes behind the specific criteria and then how to meet. This is one that I find really valuable. You can come in here and show different examples of sufficient techniques. And then some of them will also show failures, which can be helpful if you're trying to um, update code so that it can pass the guidelines. Hey, Jen, can you uh, bump up the size in your browser? Yeah. Yeah. Well, here. I know this one's particularly small. Is that better? It's a little better. Let's see. Sherry, what do you think? Yeah, and I definitely encourage you to, to follow along with it. That'll kind of help get the, the reps in so it feels more comfortable. Um, and here I'll adjust my window size. I'm on a uh, ultra wide monitor, which does make things a little tricky, but is that a little better too? Okay. Coming back at the slides. Uh, so you may be wondering, gee, Jen, these uh, principles are kind of hard to remember and they seem sort of familiar. Uh, so, 
our co-host Althea put together this really great graphic, uh, which I think is a good way to remember these guidelines. So Althea was working through um, DQU's um, introductory material, and they said, think creatively, think inclusively, always design with accessibility in mind. Um, and Althea uh, came up with this, uh, pour your heart into it. So pour being our acronym for those four principles, perceivable, understandable, um, excuse me, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. So if you ever forget them, just remember to pour your heart into it. All right, so now we're gonna go into our um, four different principles a little more, and then I'm going to reference an example in the code pen. So if you wanna get that link up, you can too. And then on each of these slides, I have in bold the definition from um, WCAG. And then I have the definition that I've compiled while studying that I find to be a little bit more helpful when looking at things, but um, presenting both so you can kind of make that decision on your own. Uh, and then on this slide, I have pictured um, having Gurma. She's holding a refreshable, refreshable Braille device and she's standing with former President Obama in the White House. So for perceivable, we have information and user interface components must be presentable to users in a way they can perceive. Or how I understand that is ensuring users can access your content through one of the biological senses. In the case of web content, we're looking at sight, um, sound, and touch until we evolve to the point where we can um, smell technology, which if any of you are working on that, let me know. All right, so looking at my example for perceivable here, um, if you're not familiar with CodePen, you'll see at the top, it's got your HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. But uh, for this example, we're really just looking at the HTML. Um, and uh, so we've got the code on the top and then the actual what's rendered down below that. So for perceivable, I pulled out 1.1.1 um, non-text content, and this is uh, just level A. So if we take a look back at our guidelines, one point. 1.1 non-text content. We can see that um, this is about uh, non-text content is presented to users, uh, has a text alternative that serves the equivalent purpose. So looking back at my code pen here, um, just looking at it here, we have two images. They're both of cupcakes. But if we start to look at the code, you'll see that on the first image, the one that fails, um, I just have a source attribute and then the image. Then if we look at the second one, I have source, and then I also have an alt attribute. Uh, so this alt text is giving people using assistive technology um, a description of what is in the image. And it's important with your alt text that it's not just um, as simple as red cupcake. Uh, while that would meet the guideline, um, I think you both you all can see that um, red cupcake doesn't really give you an equivalent experience. So instead of that, I have red velvet cupcakes with white frosting, red crumbs, and a red macaron cookie on top. Uh, so the idea with the alt text is to give someone using assistive technology an equivalent experience to someone who can um, see the image on their own. All right, so back to our slides. Our um, next principle, we're on O, so that is operable. So this is user interface components and navigation must be operable or ensuring functionality to a wide range of input devices, including assistive technologies. Um, and on this slide, I have Alice Wong pictured. She's wearing a floral black and white shirt with red lipstick. Um, she has a, a trach tube attached and she's sitting in her power wheelchair. So our example for operable, I pulled out 2.1.1 keyboard and that is level A. So if we go back to those guidelines and look for 2.1.1, so two, one, one, um, all functionality of the content is operable through a keyboard interface without requiring specific timing of individual keystrokes. So for this one here, I have um, three buttons and we'll notice that one of them is failing and two of them are passing. But again, just like with the, the cupcakes, they all look the same. So let's take a look at the code. You'll see, the one that fails, it is just a button, excuse me, a div styled like a button where um, the one that passes, we have uh, an actual button and they're all styled the same. And then in the last case, I'll touch on this one a little bit more, but just so we see here, it does have a role. So it is perceived as a button. Um, now, looking at keyboard accessible, 
accessibility. One way to test this uh, when you're manually auditing a site is to tab through it. So if we tab through site in this example, um, you'll see that that first submit button does have a focus ring around it and that second one does. But if I shift and tab to go backwards, um, I can't actually access that first one there. Um, so that's an indication when you're testing a site that something's going on with the code is making it so you can't access that, that first button. And okay, back at our slides. So we've done P, O, next is U, and we have um, understandable. Uh, so for understandable, this is information and the operation of user interface must be understandable or ensuring that users can understand your content as well as how you interact with your UI. Um, and on this slide, I have Judith Human is pictured. Um, she's sitting with two of the books she's authored, and she's wearing a blue shirt with a um, bright colored flowers, and she's sitting, sitting in a power wheelchair. Unfortunately, Judy did pass away just this past weekend, and the disability community and the world around has really benefited significantly from her advocacy. I very, rec very much recommend her books. Um, Being Human includes details about how people with disabilities were part of the civil rights movement, which was something that before reading this book, I was unaware of. So looking at my example for understandable, so I pulled out 3.1.4 abbreviations. Um, and you'll notice that this one is a AAA. So that is the um, kind of the, on the high end of the conformance level. And if we take a look back at the guidelines, 3.1.4. So we're gonna go down to understandable, 1.4. And a mechanism for identifying the expanded form or meaning of abbreviations is available. So in this case, I've got um, just two P tags. The first one, Women Who Code is an international, excuse me, I made a point right there. Um, if you didn't know that this was Women Who Code and it just says WWC is an international nonprofit organization, you're not really gonna have the full context. And actually, if you Google just WWC, you get a whole bunch of organizations that are international that are not Women Who Code. So in the second case here, you'll notice if you hover over it, that a little bubble pops up saying Women Who Code that tells you what that abbreviation is. So Women Who Code's mission is to inspire women to excel in technology careers. And if you take a look at the code for this one here, so within my P element, I have an abbreviation that has a title attribute with Women Who Code, and that's what's telling the browser to show that extended version of the abbreviation. And now moving on to robust. So on this slide, I have Emily Ladau pictured. She's wearing a floral dress, got long brown hair and is smiling while sitting in her power wheelchair. Um, and definitions for robust, got content, content must be robust enough that it can be interpreted by a wide variety of user agents, including assistive technologies, or ensuring compatibility with a broad range of browsers, devices, and assistive tech. So looking at my example for this one, you'll notice that I have those three buttons again. Um, and I think it's important to point out that there can oftentimes be multiple success criteria or, or um, guidelines for a specific type of element or, or a specific issue you may be looking at. Um, so 4.1.2, let's take a look at that one. Robust is the shortest one, so this one's a little less intimidating, but 4.1.2, name, role, and value for all user interface components the name and role can be programmatically determined. So if we come back to our code pen here, and this one, I'm actually gonna open my inspector so I can take a closer look. Um, and if you have it, this little button here selected and you hover over things, you will actually see accessibility information in that little, um, that pop up there. So you'll see on this first button here, I don't have a name, the role is generic and there's no keyboard focus where if you look at these other ones, I have a name and a role and a keyboard focus for both of them. Uh, not relevant for this guideline, but you can also see contrast information that will show up on this tooltip as well. And then taking a look again at those same buttons, you'll see that even though this, the third button is still a div styled like a button, I have a tab index and a role on there, which is um, making it more accessible. Uh, you would need to do some JavaScript to, to really make this a, a true button, but for this sake, I just wanted to point out the HTML. All right, now back to our slides. Um, so a bit of a surprise, maybe not a fun surprise, we'll see. We have a pop quiz. So uh, if you all would like to um, type in the chat your answers as I go through, I'm gonna have 
the question and then four multiple choice um, answers in there. And let me get the chat visible in here. Okay, there we go. All right, so first question, success criterion 2.4.1 bypass blocks falls under which accessibility principle? Is it A, perceivable, B, operable, C, understandable, or D, robust? Nice. I'm seeing a couple Bs, and you all are right. This is B, operable. Um, and can anyone tell me that, how do you remember that this is, that operable is number two? Yeah, awesome. Yeah, you can remember that by remembering to pour your heart into it. And then next question, as of today, what is the current version of WCAG? We've got A, 2.0. B, 2.2, C, 2.1, or D, 3.0. Awesome, I'm already seeing some C come through. That is right. C, it is currently on version 2.2, 2.1. However, 2.2 is coming out very soon. And last question, providing a name, role, and value for non-standard user interface components in order to ensure content is compatible with current and future user tools falls under which accessibility principle? We've got A, perceivable, B, operable, C, understandable, or D, robust. Awesome, that one is D, robust. Thank you for playing along in the chat. I definitely appreciate that. And then just to summarize, um, remember the four principles with pour or pour your heart into it. And then um, don't be intimidated by web standards. I know um, when I was in my boot camp, I would do everything I can to read a blog post about the um, documentation for something instead of actually reading the documentation, but that can lead you down some dark paths. So definitely reference the web standards whenever you can. And then um, when you're new with accessibility, sometimes it can be tricky to know what resources to trust. There's a lot of marketing material out there that isn't necessarily good information. Um, so one way to ensure that you're um, reading good stuff is to look for tools and resources that are referencing the WCAG guidelines. And then last, um, I hope you enjoyed the um, talk tonight and that um, you continue learning about accessibility. If you have any questions about what I talked about or getting involved with um, accessibility or considering a certification, I hope you reach out. I would be happy to chat about it. And then um, I do have um, those four people I mentioned on the slides as well as their websites and then the books that they've written. Um, all of them I would recommend um, checking out. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, and you can feel free to unmute and just say it out loud, or if you'd like to put it in the chat, that's fine too. Yeah, What? so um, Bianca's asking, what is a tool you use to audit the accessibility of a website? Um, so I currently tend to use the WebAIM Web, uh, WAVE tool. And then additionally, I also use um, DayQ's uh, built in the um, dev tools. You can use an extension there as well. It's uh, Axe Dev Tools. Um, and then depending on the code base, uh, when it's appropriate, I like including it in my testing suite as well. Uh, but I think the the wave the wave tool is a good one to get started. It pops up the icons right in the UI, so it makes it really easy to kind of see what specifically the errors are. Yep, Sherry, I believe Jen um, posted a link to the slides, but she can certainly share them again. Yep, I'll drop that in now. Melissa, did you have a tool that you prefer over Wave? I saw that you had a sad face. Wave, uh, Wave was really great. Sorry, this is Melissa speaking. Um, Wave was really great at its like inception, but I feel like it's fallen off. Um, I like, I think Microsoft Insights is doing a really good job at their tool, um, echoing you on the Axe Dev tool, as well as um, I think it's the Arc by um, 
Ooh, is it TPGI has a pretty good automated tool now too? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I would agree with that. I have started noticing that there are things um, Axe is picking up that Wave is not. Yeah, um, so Rose, we asked the question, um, how do you manage accessibility and aesthetic? For example, the dot, dot, dot under the abbreviation may not be part of a preferred aesthetic, but even if you hide um, this styling, it may not be observable. Um, so I, I have kind of two thoughts about that. First, I, there's sort of a little bit of a myth that accessibility isn't necessarily beautiful or isn't good design. Um, and I'd point you towards the Ally Project website, excuse me, the A11Y project. Um, I think they've done a really good job at, at kind of showing what you can do with design and still ensure accessibility. And then um, it, sometimes you need to get creative. Um, there are cases where maybe you need to push back on design and, and you know, find that balance between usability, accessibility, and design. Um, and then, um, you know, there are ways to, you know, have a maybe a custom tool tip that shows your abbreviations. Um, I would also note that the one on abbreviation was the only one I showed that is uh, the uh, AAA. So in most cases, organizations are not looking to meet AAA. Uh, so in that case, you could just have women who code for the first time that you reference it and then use the abbreviation moving forward. So um, there is flexibility in the guidelines, um, and there's definitely multiple different ways to meet it um, besides just the ones I showed this evening. And then, Lisa, I think I cut you off. I'm sorry if, if you want to go ahead and ask your question. Oh, no worries. I was just going to ask uh, what the um, the alternative to WAVE was. I missed what it was called. Yeah, it's um, it's by DayQ and it's the Axe Dev Tools, um, A X E. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks, Jen. Um, and I think I missed one up here from uh, Christina. Um, can many of the popular UI design tools be used to convey accessibility requirements to developers, et cetera? You mean like, like Figma and, and Adobe, I'm assuming? Um, and, and yeah, there's definitely ways in Figma to, um, like, uh, for example, your page structure, um, indicating when something should be an H1 and when something should be an H2, not just for design reasons, but, but also so that uh, the developers understand kind of how a user would be reading the page. So there's, I'm not a, an expert with with Figma or Adobe, but there's definitely ways to to do that. Okay, and then I see a question from Sherry. Um, how accessible are popular sites like Amazon and new sites and YouTube when compared to the WCAG guidelines? Um, so I think it's interesting you mention YouTube in there because YouTube is a website that allows other people to make content. Um, so that definitely um, makes it hard for a company like YouTube to ensure that everyone else's content is accessible. So I think with sites like um, Facebook or Instagram or, or LinkedIn and YouTube, there's definitely a little bit of responsibility of giving content creators the tools to make it accessible. Um, I don't know if you've ever added alt text to something like Instagram, but oftentimes you have to make the post and then go back in and edit it to add the alt text. So I think things are improving overall, but there, there's definitely, I think, always room for improvement. And then as for Amazon and, and um, what was the one you mentioned, new sites, I, I would encourage you to run an accessibility tool, kind of play with it. That's definitely something I, I enjoy doing when I'm, I'm looking at a new site. Um, I do know that, uh, Target was um, went through lawsuits a number of years ago, and they actually part of the uh, resolution of the lawsuit is that they have to be audited by um, I can't remember which organization it was, but one of the organizations that um, advocates for um, people who are blind. So Target actually is is relatively accessible. Um, unfortunately, it had to come to to a lawsuit to get to that, but. Okay, and then Marlon has. Um, a question. I've seen some websites have a figure icon that allows the website to be modified to the individual needs. Is this part of 
making a website more accessible. Um, so I believe what you're talking about are um, accessibility overlays and generally the accessibility community is, is not in favor of overlays. Uh, most people with disabilities find that they make it harder to access what they need um, or even kind of overwrite personal settings that they have in there. Um, they overlays kind of make a promise that just add in this one line of JavaScript and suddenly your site is accessible and that um, if you know anything about JavaScript is it's definitely a big promise to make. Um, I think that you're you're better off um, putting your effort and time and money into making your website accessible from the start instead of trying to add an overlay to to make it better. Um, I don't know about Hop and Sherry. Is that I'm I'm not familiar. Um, but I would guess if it has lots of overlays, then it probably has issues. Um, yeah. Althea, did you raise your hand? Do you want to ask a question? Yes, um, I started learning about accessibility in February, and I started creating a list of um, things that I found helpful, uh, mostly tools for inclusive language and content, actually. And if you want, I can share in the chat like of the list I've things I've been looking for and things that I found along the way. Yes, yeah, was... um, this is mostly for like content creators, uh, people who are like on the visual more rather than the web development side. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great way to get started though, especially with like gaining uh, comfort and familiarity with alt text is start adding alt text to your Instagram posts. Like I think that's a, an easy accessible way to start thinking about it. Yes, and then a lot of people think um, a lot of accessibility just is straight to the keyboard, but there's also like cognitive accessibility as well. So mm -hmm. keep in mind of that. Yeah, thanks, Alia. Anyone have any last questions for Jen? All right, well, if not, um, thank you, Jen. That talk was awesome. I loved your slides and really some great resources for you all to dive into the W3C standard and um, get used to reading those specs. Um, let's see, anything else before we close out, Jen, want to add? Um, I guess I'll just add that if you have any interest in a speaker, um, in speaking, we'd love to, to hear from you. Um, I used to like get so nervous with these things, but after doing two or three of them at this point, it definitely becomes um, more comfortable. And um, at that, we will leave it. We hope to see you all for April event. Um, we actually do have a speaker for that one, <laughs> but uh, May, we still need you. So Thank you all for coming and I hope you have a great March. Bye everyone. Bye.